All right, welcome everybody. My name is Kimberly Doris and I'm the Executive Director and CEO of the Graves Disease and Thyroid Foundation. Uh, today's webinar is Graves Disease, Thyroid Eye Disease and COVID-19. Uh, a quick note that you will also hear the acronym TED or TED in place of thyroid eye disease. I'm pleased to introduce our two presenters today and I'll also be moderating the Q&A session. First up will be Dr. Terry J. Smith the Frederick G.L. Hutwell Professor in Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences at the University of Michigan. He's an internationally known endocrinologist who has studied Graves disease, its eye manifestations, and related autoimmune disease for over 30 years. Dr. Smith's laboratory was among the first to describe the unique molecular attributes of tissue surrounding the eye that make it susceptible to inflammation in Graves disease. Following Dr. Smith's talk, we'll hear from Dr. Don O. Kikawa, he serves as Professor of Clinical Ophthalmology, Chief of the Division of Ophthalmic Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery, and Vice Chairman at the University of California, San Diego Department of Ophthalmology and UCSD Shiley Eye Institute in La Jolla. He is also co-director of the UCSD Thyroid Eye Center and a former program director of UCSD's ophthalmology residency. Uh, before I turn it over to Dr. Smith, I'll note that what you hear today reflects our current understanding of COVID-19, but this is obviously a rapidly developing situation. If we get new information that either enhances our understanding or conflicts with what you hear today, uh, we will get that information out to you. You can find us on Twitter and Facebook at, at GDATF, that's GDATF for Graves Disease and Thyroid Foundation, and you can visit us at gdatf.org or at onegravesvoice.com, which is a collaboration between the GDATF, Horizon Therapeutics, and Rare Life Solutions. Uh, the foundation does receive funding for our educational programming from Horizon Therapeutics, although we maintain complete independence with regard to all decisions on content. Uh, this is the foundation's first webinar, and I'd like to give a quick shout out to Horizon Therapeutics uh, and to uh, Vaz Advisors. Uh, Paul from Vaz Advisors is here with us today uh, with a technical assist. Uh, and with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Smith. Good afternoon. Uh, Terry Smith here uh, in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, this afternoon, um, we would like to review for you um, how Graves' disease thyroid eye disease, or TED, and the current COVID-19 pandemic might intersect, and whether or not um, those of you with, with Graves' disease, TED, or other thyroid conditions need be uh, any more concerned about the current pandemic than, than the general population. And thank you all for joining us this afternoon. So COVID-19 is, is actually one of the SARS uh, first cousins. Uh, I'm sure you all remember the SARS pandemic, uh, or actually it was an epidemic um, uh, several years ago which caused uh, acute respiratory uh, uh, disease. Uh, the SARS-CoV-2, uh, which is the uh, uh, COVID or coronavirus 2, is a novel um, virus. Um, uh, we believe that emanated from uh, bats um, and uh, because it is a uh, virus which uh, is unique to the human experience uh, uh, with uh, infectious agents. Um, there is no uh, uh, pre predecessing um, uh, immunity uh, toward, toward uh, COVID-19. And thus, um, uh, those of us who have uh, the the uh, misfortune of of contracting uh, the virus um, uh, will have for our own uh, bodies what is a a novel response. So uh, COVID nineteen is is one of the RNA viruses. 
Um, it's, it's got a fairly uh, uh, simple uh, genome of 15 separate genes, uh, and there are currently identified uh, four vaccine targets um, with, uh, against which um, much of the uh, 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 vaccine strategy development that you're hearing about on television uh, is being directed against. Uh, important to how uh, this uh, uh, coronavirus attacks the human being, uh, the cells of in our body, uh, is something called the spike like a protein, which binds to the uh, ACE2 receptor or angiotensin converting enzyme 2 receptor, which allows it to gain entrance into the human cell. So, I'd like to review for you some of the general principles uh, that, that are involved in, in immune function. Um, first of all, I think it's, it's important for you to realize um, how uh, a protein, how, how many different tissues in the body um, uh, contain elements of, of the immune system. Um, and the immune system uh, comprises cells and, and chemicals uh, which, which help fight infection, destroy cancer. And for those of us who, who have autoimmune diseases, uh, engage in, in mischief, um, which, which can lead to whatever sort of of uh, autoimmune disease we might we might be manifesting. It's it's remarkably complex uh, as it would have to be to be able to respond to so many different uh, foreign invaders, bacteria, viruses, cancer cells, etc. Um, it, it it has a memory uh, uh, which allows strengthening and focusing of uh, responses to uh, danger signals. Um, our, our immunity changes with age, with, with the arrays of medicines we, we are currently taking and those we received uh, from our childhood on. Um, much of our immune function is inherited from our parents and forebears. So um, I'd like to parse the immune system uh, out for you into uh, two major branches. One is known as the innate immune response, um, comprising uh, the skin, stomach lining, natural barriers that that protect us from from uh, 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 microbes that that might be trying to penetrate our bodies and uh, inflammatory uh, mediating cells such as uh, uh, monocytes, dendritic cells, um, uh, macrophages, et cetera. And then the adaptive immune response uh, uh, system which, which comprises B cells, which are, are the uh, cells that make antibodies, these these very complex molecules that, that help um, attack uh, uh, foreign substances uh, and T cells, uh, which, which not only enable B cells to, to function uh, in terms of antibody response, but, but T cells also uh, infiltrate uh, uh, tissues at areas of, of uh, damage and uh, activation, and they produce um, molecules uh, known as cytokines, which are really involved in, in uh, the, the inflammation, the swelling that one sees when, when one is uh, 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 somehow uh, uh, infected or has a mechanical injury, burns, things like that. So, so what's really important 
to also uh, uh, know about is, is that the immune system uh, has T cells and B cells that, that produce these, these molecules called cytokines and um, that, that uh, propel the immune res response, make it, make it more robust, uh, sort of like the accelerator on your car. And then another a bunch of, uh, of B cells and T cells uh, known as regulatory cells, which apply the breaks. They, they dampen the immune response when, when it's uh, overzealous. So the, the immune response really has global um, uh, uh, impact on virtually every uh, tissue in the body. Um, uh, it can help regulate how energy is generated, how molecules, uh, fuel molecules are stored and how they're utilized. Um, it impacts on, on our brain function and how our, our wounds heal after surgery, how, how our scars uh, get formed and uh, determines uh, how we age. There are multiple factors influencing immune function. Um, our gender, uh, the genes that, that we inherited from, from our, our parents, um, the foods we eat, uh, the pollutants in the air, stress, fatigue, um, the bacteria in our in our intestine or the microbiome uh, is now understood to be a very important factor in determining um, whether people develop autoimmune diseases, cancer, and other diseases. And pregnancy is a very important. Uh, uh, influence on, on immune uh, function. So now I, I want to get into the, the nexus between autoimmunity, which is overzealous um, immune response to oneself versus what happens when we become infected. So in broad terms, autoimmunity is the misidentification of some element of self as foreign. And this can lead to serious tissue dysfunction, dist uh, destruction, and disease. Infectivity and the body's response to it can lead also lead to tissue damage um, in organs, and uh, this can occur um, throughout the body. Um, with regard to the COVID-19 uh, infection, and not only uh, are lungs affected, but, but now we know that heart, kidney, liver, even the brain may be uh, impacted uh, uh, by, by this infection, both um, through direct and indirect uh, mechanisms. So what I want you to walk away with from, from today's session is, is that immune surveillance uh, is, is kind of like a teeter-totter. And, and there's a fulcrum which, which uh, uh, maintains uh, the balance between overzealous responses such as those that occur in autoimmune disease versus um, underperformance, let's say, where, where um, uh, infections and cancer um, might occur and might be um, uh, deleterious. So Graves' disease and Hashimoto's are, are the two most common forms of, of autoimmunity uh, of the thyroid. And I presume, presume that, that many of you in the listening audience uh, this afternoon have one of these uh, disorders. And, and 
essentially they both have at their very core this this um, uh, reaction to what what are really normal tissues, um, normal cells, but that are misidentified. And whether it's the, the T cell that I just described or the B cell, which, which uh, generates uh, autoantibodies, um, these, these two cell types collaborate. And uh, in, in diseases like Graves' disease, Hashimoto's, rheumatoid arthritis, type 1 diabetes, has destruction of specific tissues uh, in the thyroid, in the joints, in the pancreas. So the COVID-19 uh, virus uh, uh, results in, in pneumonia. And what happens uh, initially is, is that the virus adheres to the lining of the airways and the lung and starts replicating, that is, uh, uh, genera generates itself, uh, becomes more numerous. And then sentinel immune cells uh, detect the virus and activate the early post defense mechanisms of the immune system. This can result in injured cells, which release the cytokines I just described for you, uh, ca uh, causing what, what may, uh, if taken to extremes, um, cause what, uh, what is known as cytokine storm, where there's a lot of collateral damage to tissues that were not intended to be targeted by the, the, the body's response to the virus. And then ultimately, white cells react to all of these agents, the, the virus and many of the, uh, many of the cells that, that have been damaged, which are, are then in essence neutralized, made, made harmless. And this, of course, then uh, beckons uh, yet other responses which, which we, would, um, we would classify as healing. So now let's switch our attention to Graves' disease and, and how Graves' disease occurs. It's an autoimmune disease in which um, susceptibility genes coalesce with environmental factors uh, and lead to these immune responses. Um, the TSH receptor, which many of you have heard about, is the central primary autoantigen in Graves' disease. And it's the antibodies against the TSH receptor that um, uh, then cause the overactivity of the thyroid gland. Um, the orbit or tissues around the eye um, share uh, autoantigens, that is those molecules that the antibodies interact with, uh, with the thyroid. And we believe that's why um, these tissues around the eye are singled out for, for uh, involvement in TED. And then there's a relatively, uh, a newcomer to the autoantigen array in, in Graves' disease, known as the insulin-like growth factor one receptor or IGF-1R. Now, when you get Graves' disease considerably more frequently than do men, um, uh, usually in, in young, to uh, middle-aged individuals can occur with stress uh, following pregnancy. Uh, the impact of genetics, as I just mentioned, very important. Um, uh, infection has, has um, been thought to play an important role in triggering 
uh, Graves' disease. Uh, dietary iodine content seems to be important, and smoking um, is probably the most important modifiable risk factor for uh, the seriousness of Graves' disease and TED. COVID-19, on the other hand, seems to be associated uh, uh, in its in its most severe forms with advancing age, obesity, diabetes, high blood pressure, chronic lung disease, and in in individuals who are immunocompromised, such as those uh, receiving chemotherapy for cancer. So. Now let's turn our attention to um, Graves' disease and TED uh, during the pandemic. It's important to stress that there's no evidence that autoimmune diseases such as Graves' disease and TED increase either the risk of catching uh, COVID-19 or developing more severe disease than anyone else. So uh, as far as we know, the risk for um, getting the disease or having severe disease uh, is, is identical to that in the general population. It is important to correct abnormalities in thyroid function. That is, if you're hyperthyroid, hypothyroid, getting those under control um, because the immune system works best when thyroid hormone levels are normal. While routine doctor appointments are frequently being postponed uh, in the pandemic, uh, I think it's important to keep in contact with your healthcare providers. It's also important uh, that, that to date, there's no evidence that methimazole or PTU, these antithyroid medications you might be taking to control your thyroid overactivity um, uh, are increased during the, the, the uh, pandemic. So um, the same side effects that, that your doctors have warned you about uh, apply now. Um, so continued vigilance, um, looking out for uh, 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 yellowing of the skin and eyes, a rash, itching, and recurrent sore throats, really important. Um, uh, and this is no different uh, now than, than during normal times. Uh, for those of you with TED, as your doctors may have already shown you, um, the first two to three years uh, during which uh, you uh, have developed TED um, uh, involve what we call the active phase of the disease, where inflammation, swelling, and the eye disease changes from week to week. Um, and it is during this this so-called active phase that um, medicines um, for uh, TED are thought to be uh, the most effective. Um, and then the stable disease when most of these drugs don't seem to have um, as much beneficial effect um, uh, is when the disease stops changing and when surgery is, is the usual um, uh, 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 intervention. Quick rundown on the current landscape of medicines for, for TED, steroids, um, you've all heard about them. Um, they only work in about half of the patients. Um, uh, they have serious side effects. They're not disease modifying. That is, they don't appear to change the ultimate outcome of TED. Rituximab, uh, which, which uh, uh, knocks out B cells, 
uh, reduces uh, antibody production, external beam radiotherapy, uh, mycophenolate, which is an immunosuppressive, tocilizumab is a cytokine inhibitor, also immunosuppressive, and tepasa, which has just been uh, 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 registered by the FDA. So it's the only approved therapy for TED, and importantly, it does not cause general immunosuppression. So Tepasa targets the IGF-1 receptor, and that mechanism um, uh, provides the rationale for the development of Tepeza, um, which culminated in two clinical trials, um, uh, both appearing in the New England Journal of Medicine, the first in May of 2017. The, the more recent pivotal trial results were reported in January of 2020, also New England Journal of Medicine. And uh, pictures are worth a thousand words. The left uh, most uh, 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 images are of, of an individual um, who received placebo. Um, at week 24, uh, there's really not a whole lot of, of change, but look at the middle and the right hand uh, images where both patients have a remarkable improvement. Uh, in, in their eye findings. And another more recent patient, um, both uh, pre-treatment at baseline and then on the right after uh, uh, a 24-week course of eight infusions of Tepesa. Is Tepesa safe during the pandemic? The, the, the short answer, we, we're not certain, but it has a favorable safety profile, which suggests that the drug targets very specific molecules uh, uh, and uh, binds and inhibits the IGF-1 receptor. And uh, the impact then is on very focused actions uh, within the immune system, unlike steroids, rituximab, and the other treatments uh, that are currently used for TED. It may be continued during these uncertain times, but I emphasize that close monitoring by your doctors is essential, and there is currently no available evidence suggesting that uh, Tepeza is more risky during the pandemic. So the two takeaways from, from this portion of the program. There's no evidence that TED increases the risk of COVID infections or that it is associated with increased COVID-19 severity. And there's no evidence that the drug currently in, uh, in use in Graves' disease or in TED increase risk of severity of COVID-19. And above all else, as always, we're extremely grateful to our patients um, who have been uh, enormously gracious in participating in our research studies, clinical trials, and, and our molecular studies for that matter. And I'm honored to participate in uh, their medical care. And I, I'm also indebted to our colleagues in the healthcare profession with whom we work together to improve lives of, of our patients with, with these diseases. And with that, I will turn the program over to Dr. Katawa. Don? All right, thank you, Dr. Smith. Uh, Paul, uh, when you're ready, we can jump right into Dr. Kakawa's presentation. Uh, while we're waiting, I will note that Dr. Smith and Dr. Kakawa and I were all supposed to be in uh, La Jolla outside San Diego uh, about two weeks ago to host a patient education event on Graves' disease and TED, um, but obviously um, we had to cancel that, and we, we do hope to get that event rescheduled uh, once it's safe to do so, so uh, please stay tuned. All right, uh, Dr. Kakawa? Yes, can everybody hear me? Yes. Great. Uh, let me get back on to full... And how are the slides? 
uh, slides look good. Full screen, perfect. Uh -huh. uh, well, I'd like to thank the uh, Graves Disease Foundation for inviting me to speak. And as uh, Dr. Smith uh, mentioned, we hope you're all safe and healthy during this time. And we we realize that this is a difficult time for everyone. And many of you have had questions about uh, how your disease and thyroid condition is affected by um, COVID. So um, I'm happy to participate and, and hopefully some of the information will be useful to you. Um, so the question always arises, um, let's see if I can, I think I'm stuck. Okay, so we're, we're, we're seeing just very rapidly changing dynamics. I think you see this in the press every day. Um, some of the recommendations that uh, uh, come out uh, a couple of weeks ago may not even be valid today, uh, but we do know the patients still need care and vision affects our ability to perform daily activities and work is still important for many of us. Um, and our world may be different, but we do have to understand that our goal is to still treat patients as a whole. Um, all your healthcare providers are here if you need us. Uh, we've been seeing patients here in San Diego uh, uh, with um, more urgent needs. Um, things that can wait obviously may be delayed, but if you have any urgent changes, we suggest that you come in or at least contact your provider as soon as possible. Um, what are the guidelines for surgery during uh, this time of, of um, uh, an outbreak? Well, we divide surgery essentially into four different categories. One is emergency care, one is urgent care, one is time sensitive, and, and the final category is elective. And we'll take a few minutes just to kind of talk about each of these. So emergency care is usually required when um, loss of limb or life are uh, in, in concern or in jeopardy. And an example of this would be a car accident or trauma. So these are things that, that cannot be delayed. If there's any delay in care, this would lead to uh, very um, urgent uh, consequences and severe consequences. Urgent care is usually where we, we need to perform surgery treatment within days. So an example of this, of this could be optic neuropathy from thyroid disease. If your eyes are swollen, you see declining vision because your nerve is, is getting uh, pressure and being impinged upon, this is considered urgent. Certainly do not wait on anything uh, such as this. Time sensitive care should be addressed sooner rather than later and outcomes are better usually done now as opposed to waiting for three to six months. An example of this would be a skin cancer. So this is something that, you know, if, if we, we can wait a few weeks, but we don't certainly wanna put this off for months because it could get a lot worse. And then any, any elective care is, is one that usually has no time constraints. The outcome is as good now as, as if the procedure is performed later. And this is an example of this would be a cosmetic surgery. So uh, what assurances can we provide patients if surgery is needed? Well, many of the studies have shown that there is a very, very low risk of getting COVID from any healthcare facility. Uh, many hospitals are now testing all, are testing all their staff with both antibodies and nasal swabs. And there's a very, very low percent, I believe it's under 1% uh, positivity rate for all hospital staff. All of our patients are also tested for COVID before any surgical procedures are performed. So the risk of, of getting anything from a healthcare facility is very, very low. Now, of course, we've all seen reports in the, the news about um, outbreaks at uh, nursing homes or retirement homes. These are completely different scenarios and the uh, healthcare facilities that we seek care at are much different than that. So don't lump the, uh, the clinics and the hospitals and the doctor's offices in with the um, uh, nursing homes. Um, just taking a step back and, and just talking more broadly about thyroid eye disease, uh, we know that there probably is a, a couple different spectrums of, of disease from a clinical perspective. One is the, the type of patient that has very large muscles. And you can see on the imaging here, uh, this here shows uh, very large uh, muscles that move the eye. And then contrast that with this patient here where uh, the clinical findings may be very similar where the eye bulges and the eyelids uh, retract. But if you look on the imaging here, there's predominantly fat infiltration. And we present these as two opposite ends of the spectrum. Many of these patients fall in between. They may not necessarily have one or the other, or they actually may even have a combination, but these are kind of the two opposite ends of the extreme that we see. And it may not be totally possible to 
categorize um, which uh, type you are. We know that probably younger patients in general get more of the fat infiltration. Um, we do use a, a, um, a grading system for determining active patients. So this is known as the clinical activity score. And most of the studies that uh, Dr. Smith talked about in his talk were based on a patient's activity at the time of entry into the study. So um, the clinical activity score, or CAS, is a system um, where we grade patients based on a presence or absence of a particular finding. So for example, you can look at the photo of this patient and you can see they're very active. The eyes are red, the eyes are swollen. There is this thing that we call chemosis where the conjunctiva, the thin membrane, starts to balloon on the surface of the eye. There's this little um, anatomic uh, part of the eye called the caruncle and the nasal aspect that can be swelling. And based on the number of um, findings that are graded in the clinical activity score, we uh, will give patients either a one or a zero if that's absent. So this patient here who looks very active is uh, given a clinical activity score of seven. Uh, this can change over time. You can actually add more points. For example, if patients worsen on top of this, if their eye bulges, you can actually add an additional few more points based on follow-up exams. Uh, this is a patient here who actually, you know, just visibly has less severe disease or less clinically active disease. Uh, but still, if we were to add up all the points that uh, this patient received, this would be a total of three out of seven. And this is a good useful measure for determining uh, response to treatment. Um, many of the studies, again, the Dr. Smith participant, we saw a reduction in clinical activity score with uh, treatment with, with uh, the medications. And in general, it's, it's usually agreed upon that we should treat patients if their clinical activity score is greater than three or four. So if they're having symptoms such as any of the ones we described uh, and their total uh, is greater than three or four, then they would be in general uh, treated for, with uh, uh, treatment for thyroid eye disease. In the past, um, as Dr. Smith mentioned, there was treatment with steroids, radiation, and biologics, which are off-label monoclonal antibodies. And then um, we're all seeing um, many patients now receiving treatment with the newer medication, the newest medication, tepertumumab, uh, which, um, you know, on an anecdotal basis, I've seen several of my patients have, have good results with. Um, surgery is usually recommended when medical therapy fails. Now, why does medical therapy fail? It may have been started too late in the disease process. There may have been side effects that patients have from the, the medication that uh, they can't continue with. And then it may be ineffective just to the, due to the severity of the disease. Um, this is uh, what you probably have all read about and heard about, which is Rundle's curve. Um, Rundle was a general surgeon uh, who practiced probably about 50 years ago and developed this um, curve that was named after him, looking at disease activity on the y-axis and time. And then as we see, uh, as if we plot disease activity over time, the general trend with uh, patients with thyroid eye disease is a period of deterioration, then stability, and then improvement. Most of the surgical uh, intervention we perform is going to be in this green shaded area of the curve. If patients don't respond to medical treatment or they have worsening uh, eye disease that doesn't uh, uh, get better or there's a threat to vision and we need urgent intervention, then we will proceed with surgery kind of in this either red or, or yellow uh, shaded area. So why do we perform surgery? Um, there is a desire in, in some patients to return, return to their pre-disease state. Uh, if they haven't responded to medication or they feel like their eyes are still bulging or their eyelids are pulled back, then we can uh, discuss surgery to help return them to their pre-disease state. Many patients have constant pain and pressure that persists. There could be double vision. There could be dry eyes. And then there, there is the, um, the disfigurement portion of having eyelid puffiness and having too much skin from the eyelids being stretched out. So in general, if we look at the options available for surgery, we're typically starting with a, um, if the patient has uh, prominent eyes that, that bulge too far, that causes this pain and pressure, we uh, consider an operation called over decompression. Then the strabismus surgery is, is reserved for patients who may have uh, residual double vision or they may actually have 
worsening double vision after the first surgery. If we don't perform decompression, then we will skip that and then go straight to either strabismus surgery if the patient has double vision or either retraction repair. So uh, for those of you who have heard about decompression uh, or read about it, back about um, you know when it first was started to be performed, it was considered to be more of kind of like a, a, a dangerous operation and only perform it in cases where patients were going blind. It has evolved a lot over the last 50 to 100 years. It, it can now be done as an outpatient. Uh, we can do either one, one eye at a time or both eyes at a time. And it is thought that modern procedures are safe and effective. Um, just walking you through a patient here who had surgery from, from um, severe graves orbitopathy. This was in um, a patient who was intolerant of medications. We had to perform surgery because the eyes were starting to um, dry out severely as well as he had reduced vision from optic neuropathy. Here he is after the decompression. You can see here his eyes are now retroplaced and in, but he has strabismus, so his, eye, his, his eyes are, are uh, now crossed. Uh, this is after performing strabismus surgery where the eyes are now straightened, and then you can see his eyelids are still not in the, the best position. And then this is after performing either contraction repair. So this shows all three steps. Um, this is the start to finish uh, from what we can achieve uh, from a surgical perspective. Well, some of the questions we get sometimes about surgery is how much do we actually perform? Um, and this is individualized for each patient. We have to look at each patient, uh, how, how much their eyes are bulging. We look at old pictures. We look and see what, uh, how much reduction of um, bulging we want to achieve. And then this is based on um, how much we measure. So uh, for those of you who have prominent eyes, I'm sure you've seen this device before. This is called an exophthalmometer. Uh, this measures exactly how much the eye is bulging. And you can see on the inset on the right side of the photo, there's a little mirror that we look at. So if we look to see the front of the eye surface, where that aligns on this mirror, this corresponds to reading of about 18. Each of these hash marks is one millimeter. This is the 10 millimeter mark. This is the 15, this is the 20. So this is a um, exophthalmometry reading of about 18, which is considered in the normal range. So by um, tailoring the amount of decompression, we target certain areas of, of the uh, bony orbit that we actually sculpt and we use very fine instruments to, to enlarge some of the space. So this is a schematic view looking at an orbit. You can see the eye in the middle. And these shaded areas here are kind of the areas that we target from a, a surgical perspective. And I'm only showing this just so that, you know, if you were to, a surgeon was to discuss a lateral wall this is a right eye, so this would be the area shaded in green. If they were to talk about a medial wall, this would be the area shaded in blue. If they were to say an, an opal floor decompression, this is this little red shaded area underneath. And then if you were to have a three wall decompression, it would involve all three of these walls. And then this yellow shaded area here is what we call the orbital rim. In severe cases, we actually do even remove and sculpt some of that bone. Um, this is a CT scan showing kind of where we perform the surgery more from a schematic view from a surgeon's perspective. So keeping that previous um, diagram in mind, this area shaded here with the yellow outline is the lateral wall. This uh, kind of uh, pinkish color is the medial wall. And then this yellow double stripe is considered the orbital floor. So this is the same diagram that's uh, depicted on a CT scan that we just looked at from the, the, the diagram uh, form. Um, in terms of how much to do, this is my own algorithm and each surgeon uh, you know, can get different effects based on their experience, but this is the type of decision-making process that I go through in my mind. If I wanna try and re uh, retroplace the eye 10 millimeters, I'm gonna do the surgery that involves almost all of these. And if I wanna target less, if I wanna get the eye in four millimeters, then I'll do less uh, surgery. Uh, these are some typical patients here that had the surgery performed. This is what we consider a lateral wall. So this is this green shaded area and you can see her bulging was not quite that severe. This is before and after. And then this is a patient here who has more severe bulging and we wanna get the eye back as far as we can. This is where we target almost all the shaded areas and that's a, a before and after uh, photo. So what are some of the side, side effects of this surgery? Well, some of the common side effects we see, there may be bruising, swelling. Um, I would say there is discomfort, 
uh, that almost every patient has some, um, you know, pain sensation is, is very individual. Some patients will say, I never felt anything, and some will say, yes, I needed pain medication. So it, it's very variable between patients. So I, I, I think the, the pain level is something usually we will tell patients, whatever you have, we can treat it with medication. And most of the time, it's, it's not um, you know, something that lingers for too long. You might feel it for a few days after. Um, there are nerves that traverse the orbital uh, bones and around the eyes. So sometimes we do uh, um, gently move some of these nerves out of the way or they get bruised and there may be temporary numbness. Blurred vision is, is common because of the swelling in the eyelid as well as some of the medications we use. And then we also have to mention that there are some uncommon side effects that we sometimes see. Uh, if you look in the literature, uh, pain has been described, sinus infections, and even loss of vision has been described. Uh, with safe and modern techniques and in experienced hands, these are um, side effects that are, that are very, very minimal and very low incidence. Um, one common question that we get asked is about double vision after surgery. So as we looked in the example that we saw earlier, Sometimes patients have pre-existing double vision, and then sometimes as we shift the eye back, the muscles do move a little bit. And I don't necessarily consider this a, a complication per se. Um, we work with a, closely with uh, Dr. David Granite, who is our strabismus um, specialist, and he actually thinks as we move the eye back, it actually gives some more freedom of movement to the muscles. So we consider this uh, a, a something that may happen and it, it is considered more of an expected side effect, not necessarily a complication. I know maybe some patients who didn't have double vision before the surgery and have it after may feel that, that they're actually in worse shape, but most of the time this can be fixed and we um, you know, are able to alleviate double vision after um, a, a secondary procedure. So what is the incidence of double vision? Many uh, studies have looked at this. It does vary from institution and surgeon. Uh, if you look at the literature, it varies from a high of about 60% in some techniques and to about less than 10% with others. Um, one of the things that we do uh, tell patients is if it develops, uh, don't panic. It does not mean that something went wrong with the surgery. It is expected that it does happen in a certain percentage of the time and it is treatable. Let's talk briefly um, at the end of the talk here about eyelid surgery. So eyelid surgery is one of the first signs that we see of, of Graves' disease or thyroid eye disease. And either the upper eyelids can pull up or the lower eyelids can pull down. And typically what we see from a uh, anatomic perspective, this is a, a cross-sectional view with some of the layers of the eyelid removed. Usually we see a pulling and tightness in the levator muscle and the Mueller's muscle. And this is from the inflammation that occurs in these planes and it causes contraction. And what we're able to do with surgeries, we um, are able to gently release these muscles and move the muscle back. And what that does is it brings the lid down. We can also take some of the puffiness away at the same time. It's another patient having the upper eyelids uh, retracted before and then after lowering. We can also see lower eyelid retraction. So the muscle that pulls the eyelid um, down is called the lower eyelid retractors. And these are very closely linked to the large muscles that we see with Graves' disease. So as the muscle enlarges, sometimes we see pulling the eyelid down. And then if anyone has had uh, strabismus surgery to move the muscle, that can also make the, the lower eyelid pulling worse. Uh, and this can be repaired. Sometimes we do have to use a graft material to elevate the eyelid. So in summary, um, we, we don't want you to think during this time that you should delay any needed care. So if any of you are experiencing you know, severe pain, reduced vision, please get that checked. And then um, you know, just in summary for surgical care, I think uh, a, a lot of us still um, are able to um, offer patients uh, the ability to return to the pre-disease state uh, as long as all the medical options have been um, uh, exhausted. Uh, we do want to thank you, our patients who teach us the most, and also thank the Graves' Disease and Thyroid Foundation. Uh, uh, special thanks to uh, Kathleen and Steve Flynn, um, Kimberly Doris, and my colleague Terry Smith, who gave an excellent talk and has actually you know, been very instrumental in this groundbreaking uh, new medication that's out. Um, so I think at this time we'll take questions. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kikawa. Uh, we do have time for a few questions. Uh, the 
first question goes out to Dr. Smith. Uh, and uh, so you talked about Tapeza, and the question was, uh, does the IGF-IR binding action uh, weaken the lungs or interact with the ACE2 pathway? So um, there, there's absolutely not a scintilla of evidence that that uh, the IGF-1 receptor in any way interacts with with the uh, the ACE uh, 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 the angiotensin converting enzyme to receptor, which is the the uh, cellular component that that the virus seems to bind to and and gain entry into the target cells. Um, uh, we, we know that the actions of Tepeza or Tepertumumab are highly specific. It's, it's like the difference between a 24-pound a, a, a sledgehammer um, that steroids or rituximab might, might be likened to, to a, a laser-pointed uh, medicine um, in terms of how specific and how sparing of normal uh, body function uh, Tepeza seems to uh, leave untouched. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is for Dr. Kakawa. Uh, we keep hearing over and over again, don't touch your eyes, don't touch your eyes. Well, with TED patients, you may have bulging eyes, they may have some dryness. Is there any extra risk there? Um, and should we be taking precautions like wrap around sunglasses or goggles, or do we even have any evidence on that yet? Yeah, that's a very good question. I think we're all kind of altering our personal habits uh, during this time. I, I would say as long as you clean your hands before you touch your eyes, you're okay. I, obviously, you know, we, we don't want to rub uh, unnecessarily. We don't want to put our, our hands up there if we don't need to. And again, we're all trying to maybe reduce that as much as possible. But we certainly understand that, you know, a, a certain amount of wiping or or um, uh, touching is, is part of um, the, the Graves process. And, and I think as long as your hands are clean, I wouldn't overdo it, but just make sure you're doing this uh, not in a public area and not you know, right after you've touched a, a dirty doorknob or stair, stairwell handle, just make sure that it's done in an area after you, after you clean your hands. Okay, thank you. Uh, for Dr. Smith, is there any indications that symptoms of COVID-19 might be different for patients with thyroid dysfunction, uh, in particular fever? There's, there's no evidence to suggest that the presenting uh, symptoms of COVID-19 differ in any way from uh, uh, individuals with Graves' disease, Hashimoto's, um, or for that manner, manner uh, uh, any autoimmune disease uh, and, and the presenting symptoms of the, the viral infection in, in uh, uh, healthy individuals. Okay, thank you. Uh, for Dr. Kakawa, with many people working from home now, do you have any guidelines on managing screen time for patients living with TED uh, and any other tips for managing TED at home? Well, um, in terms of uh, the visual aspects, I don't think there's um, too much evidence that screen time or any sort of um, of the effects from the uh, the visual aspects of a monitor are detrimental to to the eyes. Uh, of course, if you have the need for uh, this intermediate ad, so many patients uh, are in need of a, a reading ad for. Um, you know, the middle age and older, that can cause strain and cause additional pain if you don't have the appropriate ad. So I think that is very useful to make sure that you're able to get glasses that you need for this intermediate reading distance uh, because strain uh, in a patient with already pre-existing discomfort of the eyes can, can make that worse and even cause headaches. So uh, I think that would be the only advice uh, that I have for, you know, screen time. Okay, thank you. Uh, so for both of our presenters, and I'll, I'll start with uh, Dr. Smith, is there any role for telemedicine in your practice uh, given the COVID-19 situation? Um, 
in short, uh, yes, there is, and and um, we we certainly can can uh, uh, make uh, certain assessments, both with regard to the the thyroid part of Graves' disease, as well as the uh, the uh, 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 ocular manifestations. Um, but as as I think um, uh, uh, most of you in the audience would appreciate, um, there are uh, certain limitations. Uh, but I'm, I'm pretty amazed, and I'd like to hear what you think, Don, um, about how uh, uh, much detail um, the high-resolution cameras uh, in in uh, uh, smartphones and and uh, uh, computers um, uh, allow us to to uh, uh, see things that that I. Uh, uh, would not have thought possible. Certainly, I, I at this point in my career, um, I can almost uh, be certain of what I'll feel in my thyroid exam by by simple observation. Uh, and just want your take on 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 how uh, this remote uh, uh, practice of medicine is is impacting and and what you see as the the uh, limitations yeah i would agree terry i think um you know we have a very visual specialty and uh i think we've been very active here in san diego at the shiley with with telemedicine and and you know it's not a hundred percent replacement for an in-office exam uh but it does give us some idea of how uh the patient is doing and you know, particularly it's a good screening tool. So for example, if uh, if you have a red eye, for example, you know, red eyes can be caused by engorged vessels that we saw in some of our presentations, or you can have a little broken blood vessel. And that, as Dr. Smith points out, can very easily be detected on a, a high resolution camera on, on the iPhone or on a laptop or desktop. So for those instances, I think it's very useful. Uh, if you need to do a more in-depth examination and look at the back of the eye or or you know, obviously any of the imaging and laboratory testing is not available, but but for for screening tools, I think it's great for more in-depth examinations. Obviously, we still haven't quite gotten there. Okay, thank you. We're getting close to the top of the hour, so we'll take uh, one last question uh, for Dr. Smith. If a patient with Graves or with Graves or thyroid eye disease gets COVID nineteen, they find themselves in the doctor's office in the hospital. Uh, what specifically should they tell their providers about their medical history? Um, I certainly would would provide the uh, the care provider with uh, um, uh, any any uh, details concerning um, a recent laboratory uh, investigation, uh, the current medications, and any uh, uh, bumps in the road uh, with regard to management of either uh, the, the uh, thyroid disease or, or TED. Uh, it's in, it's uh, Particularly important uh, if if uh, you are on um, drugs like rituximab or or uh, steroids to make absolutely certain that that your treating physicians are aware of this because uh, they may wish to to modify their approach to your viral illness uh, based on on. Uh, that sort of a comorbidity. Okay, thank you. Dr. Kakawa, would you agree or do you have anything to add to that? No, nothing to add. I think um, I agree with uh, Dr. Smith's comments. Okay. All right, well, uh, thank you to our presenters, Dr. Terry Smith and Dr. Don, Don Kakawa. Uh, thank you to Horizon Therapeutics and Vaz Advisors for the technical assistance. Uh, and thanks to you all for spending a part of your day with us. Uh, we hope you stay safe and we wish you good health. Uh, and as soon as we can get this uh, presentation posted, we'll have that up for you uh, at our website at gdatf.org. Uh, thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you, Kimberly. And Stay safe, everybody. All right. Thank you.